A 2018 paper published in The Lancet claims that surgery for hip impingement is better than the best conservative care for FAI. This is one of the first papers ever published comparing surgery to physical therapy for hip impingement, and the conclusions are not to be trusted. I'm going to take you on a deep dive through this paper so you understand why you can't trust the conclusions and what the study actually tells us. So if you're ready, let's get ready to think right, move right, and feel right. If you have hip pain and somebody has told you that you have FAI bone shapes or femoral acetabular impingement, you've probably also been told that surgery is your best course of action because exercise cannot change your bone shapes. What you probably haven't been told is that the FAI bone shapes have nothing to do with pain, have nothing to do with range of motion, and won't affect anything on any sort of physical test. I've made many videos on this that I'll link to so you can watch them at the end after you've finished this video. Even if we leave the facts about FAI bone shapes aside, we can look at a study like this to examine how effective surgery really is versus physical therapy. This is one of the first studies to do it in a randomized controlled trial, but it is hugely problematic. I'm gonna show you exactly how the research in this study was designed for a specific outcome. And that outcome was to show that hip arthroscopy is better than physical therapy. I'm gonna leave a link to the full text of this study down in the description box so you can do the research for yourself and see what I'm talking about. So let's jump straight to the conclusion. They say that hip arthroscopy and the personalized hip therapy protocol that they designed for this study both improved people's hip-related quality of life, but that hip arthroscopy led to a greater improvement than did personalized hip therapy, and the difference was clinically significant. Well, that seems pretty straightforward. It seems straightforward, but let's dig a little bit deeper. In this study, they took a bunch of patients and they said, hey, today we're gonna randomize you. Some of you are going to get surgery, some of you are going to get physical therapy. We're gonna follow up with you after 12 months from today. We're gonna to use a questionnaire called the IHOT 33, which is a questionnaire that asks you a bunch of questions about how your hips feel and your general quality of life. They had patients do the IHOT 33 before their treatments and after their treatments. So if you got assigned to PT, you do the IHOT 33, you answer all those questions, and then after you've completed the many months of physical therapy, you complete the questionnaire again and see what your score is from start to finish. If you're assigned to the surgery group, you do the IHOT 33, you wait around, you get your surgery, and then a few months more pass, hopefully, which I'll get to later, and then you take the IHOT 33 again and see what your scores are. Compare your starting score to your finishing score. Now, before I give you the average scores from start to finish for both groups, I want you to understand what the IHOT 33 looks like and understand how it's scored. The IHOT 33 is usually given on a computer where you have something called a visual analog scale. I have a printed out version here that's a little bit different, but the idea is still the same. On the computer version, you would have this line where this side, zero, means you have significant impairment, and this side is a 10 where you don't have any problems at all. So your worst score is always here, your best score is always here, and whatever the question is on the computer, you just mark on the line roughly where you feel like you are on that scale. The computer will look at how far to the right you've marked on the line and assign a numerical value to your answer. And it'll do that for every one of the 33 questions on this questionnaire. On this printed version, we have zero to 10. On the computer version, it's actually gonna score each question on 100, but the idea is the same, it's just different by a factor of 10. For the sake of simplicity, I'm gonna use the zero to 10 scale that's on this PDF that I got from a hip surgeon's website. For the personalized hip therapy group, the average starting score was 35.6 and the average finishing score was 49.7. For the FAI surgery group, the starting average score was 39.2, and the average finishing score was 58.8. Reading from the study, they say that the mean difference in IHOT 33 scores adjusted for blah, 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 was 6.8 in favor of hip arthroscopy, meaning surgery did a little bit better than PT. Okay, so it did better. Is this video over now? No, this video is not over because we need to look at what this actually means. You hear these numbers, but you have to look at the questionnaire to understand what these numbers actually correlate to. 
Let's start with the personalized hip therapy group. The average finishing score was a 49.7, which would place you squarely in the middle, right? Just below a five on the line of every one of these questions. What does that mean? That means you're basically moderately impaired on all of these questions. If your average score is a 50, you're straight down the middle. So clearly that's not really that good. You're straight down the middle. That means you have some trouble. It may not be severe, but it's at least moderate on a lot of different aspects of your life. So then let's talk about the hip arthroscopy group. The final average score was around 58.8, which puts you just a little bit below a six, which means you're still basically in that moderately impaired range. Wait, but if the surgery fixes the bone shapes, why are you still moderately impaired? That's a great question. If the surgery were actually fixing the problem, you would expect that people would feel a lot better and would be closer to the nine and 10 range on all of these questions. Instead, the average score was a 58.8, which is not a passing grade on any test. In addition, there were seven serious adverse events in the hip surgery group only. There were no serious adverse events in the conservative care group. In the conservative care group, people reported getting muscle soreness or hip pain and stiffness, but nothing really terrible. In the hip surgery group, you also got muscle soreness and you got stiffness and hip pain, but you also got the added benefit of numbness in your groin, leg, or foot. Some people had superficial wound problems. They had hip joint infection in one patient who then required a full hip replacement. And there were some other adverse events like numbness in the thigh, scrotal infection, scrotal bruising, labial swelling, and ankle pain. And then there's other stuff like nausea because of the analgesics and numbness of the tip of the tongue. And there are some other adverse events that they say are not related to intervention in table three of this study. And they say knee pain, lower back pain are not related to the intervention either in physical therapy or in surgery, which I find to be very interesting. And you should find it interesting too. If you develop back pain or knee pain when you're doing something to your hips, then it shouldn't be considered a unrelated adverse event. If you work on muscles that are around your hip joint, it's going to affect how you can move your pelvis. It's going to affect all your movement abilities and that's gonna affect your knee and your spine. It's crazy to think that you could knock somebody out, go in and shave the bones and then have them rest for several months and not in some way have an effect on potentially the knee joint or the back. Physical therapy exercises to train muscles around the hip are going to directly affect the knee joint and the spine. Hmm, doesn't sound like they were thinking straight. No, I don't think they were thinking straight and there are still more problems with this study than the ones we've already gone over. Earlier I mentioned that the 12-month follow-up started from the date of randomization, which means if today I were to get assigned to the surgery group, 12 months from now I would get my follow-up. That means across the surgery group, the final follow-up date would vary widely because people would have delays in actually getting their surgery, which they mention here in this study. When they designed the follow-up period, they anticipated that patients would have to wait no more than three months to get their hip surgery. But due to factors beyond their control, some patients had to wait many more months to get their surgery. And that resulted in some of these surgery patients getting follow-up within a few months, or in some cases, a few weeks of their surgery. That means many of the surgery patients had less time to recover following surgery before they had to answer their IHOT 33, which is very important when you look at some of the questions in the IHOT 33. What I mean is that some of the questions on the IHOT 33 are really open to interpretation and require you to make some predictions about the future. And if you are a patient who had the surgery recently, it's gonna greatly affect how you answer the question. For example, there is question number 25. How concerned are you that your job will make your hip worse? Let's say I've just had the surgery two months ago. I'm really not back to 100% yet. I may still be sitting on the couch a lot. I don't even have the ability to run yet. But if you ask me this question about whether my job will make my hip worse, my belief is that this surgery fixed the problem. So 
I'm not going to be concerned at all. If you look at question 27, how frustrated are you because of your hip problem? Again, if I've just had the surgery and I'm convinced that my bone problem has been fixed, I'm not going to be frustrated at all. Or let's look at question 31. How discouraged are you because of your hip problem? If I've had the hip surgery and the surgeons and doctors have all told me that the hip surgery fixes my bone shape, then I'm not going to be that discouraged if you just fixed my bone shape. So this short follow-up window makes a big difference to how you interpret these results. You can't really reliably know whether the surgery worked if you had people whose follow-up period was so short. When you look at another study that had a two-year follow-up window, they found that people who did physical therapy and surgery ended up both feeling like meh, didn't change anything. And when you look at another study that looked at the expectations for FAI surgery and the actual results, you see that more than half of people are disappointed by the results of FAI surgery. So when you look at things in that context, you can see how problematic this study really is. Yeah, that sounds pretty problematic. But that's not the end of it. When you look more deeply at the personalized hip therapy protocol that they used in this study, you discover that the whole thing was designed to fail. I'm gonna do a separate detailed video on the personalized hip therapy protocol for FAI, but I'm gonna highlight one thing right now, which was that it was developed based on the experiences of clinicians treating patients with FAI and not by targeting deficiencies observed in patients with FAI. Meaning, what they did to create the PHT protocol was to take exercises that other PTs recommended, but they didn't take exercises that actually addressed the movement dysfunctions. And I want you to sit down before I get to this next thing. Are you sitting? Okay, good. You should sit too. No? You don't want to sit? Okay, fine. The PHT protocol had a hard line prohibition on painful end range stretches. That means they completely banned the practice of trying to get more flexible. The rationale for this is that the bones are the problem. So if you are going into a stretch where you feel uncomfortable or painful, it means that you're smashing bones together and creating a worse situation. This is a classic orthopedic surgeon's mindset about how the body works. Your bones don't move themselves. Muscles move your bones. When you feel discomfort, that doesn't mean that the bones themselves are causing a certain angle or position to be wrong. It means your muscles are not positioning the bones well. So if you feel pain moving into a certain position, that doesn't mean you're damaging the bones. Your bones aren't that easily damaged by just a light stretch position. What it does mean is that the muscles around the bones are not positioning the bone correctly, and that may lead to things feeling pinched, because maybe you're pinching a muscle or a tendon, or pinching soft tissue, or maybe you're jamming something, but if you can train the muscles to do the right thing, you can improve that situation. But if you take the orthopedic model and just think, well, pain means bones are colliding, then you have no hope of making anything better. And that's the mindset, that's the belief that is inherent in the PHT. And that's not to say that if you're stretching and you feel something painful that you're doing it correctly. That's to say that you need to learn how to stretch correctly. So if you feel jamming when you go into a stretch in this closing angle, you need to back out of it and aim the stretch into the muscles where the stretch belongs. You may need to bend your knee a little bit. You might need to change the angle a little bit. You might need to learn to contract a muscle to feel the right stretch in the right place. So while it's not a good idea to do really painful stretches that hurt in the wrong place, it is a good idea to do stretches that are uncomfortable, that are challenging, but are felt in the muscles that you're targeting in the right way. That kind of nuance is not included in the PHT because the PHT only has 24 exercises to choose from and only two of them can even be called a stretch. The rest are kind of crazy and useless and one of them is not even an exercise you can do at home on your own. It's just another therapeutic technique that a physical therapist would do on you. So I don't even know why it's included in the PHT. Again, I'm gonna make a video about this so you understand just how wild and crazy this is. Finally, the personalized hip therapy protocol for FAI 
is ridiculous in terms of the timeline that it sets for you to get better. The PhD went through several crazy revisions and the final revision said that you could get physical therapy sessions over the course of six months. The first 12 weeks was the minimum of this PhD protocol and over those 12 weeks you would get six contacts with your PT. What's a contact? They use the term contact because they're not all PT sessions. In fact, what they say is at a minimum you have three sessions in person and then your other sessions can be done over the phone or by email. So let's say you got assigned to the PT protocol here in this hip impingement study. Well great, over the first three months you can do three sessions in person and hopefully you can do three more sessions in person but if not, you can just get on the phone and that's just as good as having somebody in person supervising you and helping you understand how to do exercises correctly. Wait, are you being sarcastic or ironic here? Because I don't think an email or a phone call is the same as an in-person session. You got me, because email and phone is not the same as being in person. And by the way, the average length of a physical therapy session in the UK is 30 minutes. So if you got your three in-person sessions and they were 30 minutes long, you got a whole 90 minutes of instruction. And if you got all six of your sessions in person, then you got a whole three hours of personalized instruction to help you with exercises that are designed to fail. And after that initial 12 weeks, you still have another 12 weeks of physiotherapy. And in that 12 weeks, you get four booster sessions that can be done in person or through email or over the phone. So in short, in this study, surgeons compared surgery against really crappy physical therapy that was designed to not help anybody. The biggest surprise is that the physical therapy protocol actually managed to create some improvement in the patients who underwent it. Wasn't this study published in The Lancet? Yes, somehow this absurdly biased paper was published in The Lancet. If I was the president of a company that sold vitamins and I published a study that said taking my brand of vitamins was better and more effective than resistance training for building muscle for people of all ages, you would want to read my study very, very carefully and critically. You'd want to see the raw data and understand how I came to my conclusion that vitamins are better than resistance training for building muscle. Because I would stand to benefit from selling more vitamins, you would be aware of the strong risk of bias in my study. When you look at today's study on hip surgery, you might not be surprised to see that the lead investigator is a practicing orthopedic surgeon who draws fees from the Stryker Corporation, which is a corporation that makes $17 billion dollars a year on orthopedic surgery. The lead author on this study is also a board member of the International Society of Hip Arthroscopy, so there is definitely a risk of bias. And despite that bias, when you look at the scores, the surgery for FAI didn't really perform very well. It didn't actually cure people's hip pain. So it's important to keep that in mind when you're reading a study that seems to be very optimistic about the use of surgery to fix hip impingement. So now is the video done? It's almost done. I just want to invite you to continue to dive deeper into the research. I've got links that are in the description box that'll help you make sense of this whole FAI hip impingement mystery. I also want to encourage you to go out and find a mobility and flexibility coach somewhere local to you so you can get somebody's hands-on supervision and attention. Remember to ATM always think muscles. The science is very clear that the bone shapes and all the ortho orthopedic tests and scans and whatever don't really correlate with actual symptoms and the surgery clearly isn't working. If you can't find somebody local to you, then look online and see if you can get Zoom sessions with somebody. And if you can't find a local coach to help you, then I encourage you to check online. Check out my online programs that'll help you help yourself at home. They're money back guaranteed. So if they don't help you, you get your money back. I don't make any money if you don't find relief, if you don't find something of benefit for your hips. Check out the FAI Fix program at the FAIFix.com or go to uprighthealth.com slash DIY and check out the Healthy Hips program. Both of those programs will help you start using the muscles of your hips so that they start feeling better. Healthy Hips 1 is an easier entry for beginners to just start following along and doing some hip exercises.
exercises. And the FAI Fix program gives you a little more in depth with some testing and assessments that you do on yourself to figure out what your top priorities might be. And once again, both programs are money back guaranteed because if they don't help you, I don't wanna keep your money. I want you to go find the help you need to help yourself. For more videos that'll help you understand hip impingement and hip pain, check these out here. If you wanna support this channel, use the thanks or join button on YouTube or the PayPal or Patreon links you'll find in the description box. Like, share, and subscribe with the bell notification on. And as always, I hope you remember that pain sucks. Life shouldn't.